Welcome to today's VOD TV real-time conversation. Oh my gosh, I'm excited because we've got Tom Coughlin and uh, the Merkley brothers from, uh, from Locomation. So we're going to talk about, what we're going to talk about, you know, as technologists are reaching for the stars with amazing new technology, it's really important that the fruits of, of those exciting breakthrough developments are available for everyone. And at the same time, for those developments to reach their full potential, it how are the decisions going to be made? It can't be made necessarily by a select group, a few, to make the decisions for the rest of us. So the questions that we'll be asking today is, you know, how can professional associations, academics, and industry work together to, to ensure that the most good can be done for the greatest benefit possible? And I think that also includes, to paraphrase my friend, Alan Kornhauser is, is bringing and getting communities involved as well. All those things play into this. And who we have here, first we have Locomation. And Locomation, uh, you may have seen the VOD TV interview from CES a couple years ago. They're doing some very interesting things in automating the trucking industry to really improve things for the driver as much as improve efficiency and which could lead to better results for the end customers, for the people who buy and want things like fresh fruits and vegetables, for instance. And then we have Tom Coughlin, who's uh, past IEEE USA president. He's the current uh, president-elect for IEEE uh, 2022. Candidate. Tom's, oh, go ahead. I'll let you jump in, Tom, and, no, and clarify candidate. that. Candidate. The candidate. Right. candidate. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and he's also a storage expert and consultant. And uh, I've been helping Tom, full disclosure, I've been helping Tom with his campaign edit videos. I'm not an IEEE member, but having seen the way Tom works and as importantly, seeing the, the types of volunteers and the number of volunteers that get involved with, the types of things that Tom wants to do to extend beyond the reaches of IEEE, uh, I, you know, I have to give my support to Tom. So, um, And so that's, I, I thought that there'd be an interesting conversation today to uh, get these folks together. And, um, and, and we'll start with you, Tom, and why you think it's important to get the IEEE and the industry together. And then, you know, we'll ask uh, uh, Satan, uh, Satan and Taken uh, their thoughts on um, locomation and how they came out of Carnegie Mellon to start that enterprise. So Tom, why don't you uh, kind of give us your thoughts on the IEEE and, and why it's important to work with industry. Sure, so the organizations which uh, became the IEEE in 1963, uh, such as the American Institute of Electrical Engineers uh, were founded by folks from industry, you know, giants at the time, you know, Thomas Edison, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, Tesla, you know, so uh, IEEE has its roots in practical applications of technology. And we have, and IEEE has been having, a, uh, in my mind, uh, a crisis um, that we have been losing members in industry in the IEEE since uh, the turn of the century. And um, it's a significant loss of members. I think something like 50% of uh, the, the industry members have been lost over that period of time. And I think we need to do, uh, IEEE needs to uh, change uh, a number of things that we do to create greater value for members who are in industry and uh, more participation and connection uh, with activities uh, that would be attractive to industry or that would, uh, would benefit industry. As, so I, I, it's a real, a real important thing that IEEE does is to strengthen those connections again, both for the, the members in industry and also uh, for the ideas in industry. And one of the big things there is something in I, that I think is a real value potentially if we, if we use it better is IEEE's Future Directions Committee, which is looking at uh, technologies that uh, can change the world, you know, and, and for IEEE to engage with those early. So, and I know that uh, the, uh, this, the folks speaking here today have actually done some things with our IEEE Future Directions Committee. So I think uh, making those kind of connections, I think is important. Tom, that's a great introduction. And uh, uh, Locomation, I think is unique because you guys as co-founders came from Carnegie Mellon, you came from academia and then you founded Locomation. So I think we'll explore that connection, but first let's tell us about Locomation and I'll, I'll bring up your website while you do that. Perfect. So given that taking is heavily pixelated, maybe I'll start uh, by giving the overview and he can jump in as, as he sees fit. 
Uh, Locomation is a, uh, a, a full stack self-driving company. Our overall goal, long-term goal is actually to automate everything that moves. So that's actually hidden in our name. It's the mashup of locomotion and automation. But uh, that's obviously a very vague and very long-term goal. And we need to start with something very tangible, very near term and stay focused. So uh, when uh, we take in myself and our uh, uh, rest of our co-founders, when we were still uh, full-time faculty members at uh, Carnegie Mellon's Robotics Institute, and we decided to start Locomation, uh, we did a really meticulous analysis of what we, what we should uh, focus on to build a successful business that relies on innovation, but ultimately it's... Uh, the, uh, the, the business case that's going to resonate and, and make it a long-lasting endeavor. And uh, freight automation and uh, uh, particularly middle mile freight automation with trucking uh, was really obvious uh, from our point of view as the, the, the ripest part of the supply chain to disrupt. It's, uh, it has, it's not just the largest portion of the uh, freight industry, it is also the portion that suffers from significant pain points such as increasing driver shortage and uh, chronic uh, asset utilization problems. So it's a, a very low margin, very um, archaic industry that hasn't changed in uh, the way it functions in almost a century. And uh, obviously now that the world is uh, heading towards a different uh, uh, direction, the uh, Socio-economical uh, behaviors are changing in sometimes irreversible ways. We are relying more and more on e-commerce. The manufacturing uh, backend of the industry uh, relies more and more on modern um, philosophies like just-in-time manufacturing and zero inventory manufacturing. So everybody wants to ship more stuff around, wants more visibility, accuracy, and um, certainty around the shipment workflows, and wants to pay less for it. So uh, we decided to focus on freight automation and particularly the middle mile automation as our first step. So that meant semi-trucks. But then uh, the thought of uh, eliminating the human driver and making an 80,000 pound truck drive itself with no one around at 70 miles an hour, the required safety and reliability evidence uh, for the mass deployment of that technology is uh, going to take a long time to accumulate and it's actually going to take uh, a clever way of exposing the technology to the real world at scale in a safe manner. So our little um, workaround for this was to adopt a, a, a portfolio approach and adopt a phased approach to, to autonomy, starting with human guided convoy. We said, okay, so let's build an autonomous truck, fully autonomous truck from day zero, but initially let uh, that truck drive itself only as long as it is driving right behind a human-driven leader truck, like a little duckling, and go wherever the lead truck goes. That enables us to solve uh, important, significant, uh, uh, and fundamental problems of autonomy and create a safe foundational layer from get-go and leaves what they call the long tail problem, the, all the little variations in the real world, all the edge cases, all the situations that we can't even imagine by definition, solving those to the later stages as we start deploying the convoys, start generating value. Of course, as, com as a company, we, we like the idea of making money in the process and uh, collecting vast amounts of validation data from real world. So that's how locomation, uh, came to be. We've been around for a little bit over three years. Uh, we, are a, uh, we are fashionably late to the autonomous uh, driving party, but uh, upon our arrival, we made uh, immediate uh, significant progress and we got to a point where we have a strong uh, commercial traction as we speak today. Yeah, you've, uh, you've got quite a few contracts with uh, established trucking companies, correct? That's, that's very true. In fact, as we speak, we are the only company uh, in the in the autonomous trucking space with firm purchase orders. Wow, wow! Are there any uh, any on the road yet? Uh, our test trucks uh, test trucks are on the road, but mm -hmm. our commercial deployment is still several quarters away. We are aiming to launch in the second half of next year. Hmm. Does that and these are oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say those are physically your, those are your trucks right there, right? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Familiar pictures. I've seen them. <laughs> <laughs> so these are so the, what we are seeing on the screen, and I hope that our our uh, audience can see them too. Mm -hmm. This is our uh, first generation trucks. Uh, so uh, we recently rolled out our third generation trucks that uh, we probably don't have their pictures up there uh, yet. And uh, as we speak, we are, of course, already working on the, the generation after that. We believe uh, we will go through a couple of more iterations before we uh, finalize or at least freeze the minimum viable product, version 1.0. Uh, um, and uh, we will, of course, we won't stop there. Uh, uh, as soon as we launch the, the minimum viable product, we will continue working on the next generation and then the generation after that. Tom, you were going to ask a question before I oh. jumped in, sir. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, you know, it seems to me that one of the uh, things that, uh, you know, there's probably some licensing things you have to deal with, you know, regulations that, uh, you know, buy in, uh, buy in by regulators that, it, that uh, the technology is safe, right? Right. Uh, so there are no um, clearly defined certification requirements as we speak. Huh. Huh. So the, the, uh, especially in the United States, the... Uh, both the federal and statewide uh, regulators are mm -hmm. adopting a um, kind of close hands approach, but not completely hands on and not completely wild west. Uh, there are some guidelines, there are some um, uh, expectations around the safety and reliability of the systems, but this is such a um, newly minted and still in progress field. Mm -hmm. uh, no established. Um, uh, safety standards are part of the regulatory requirements yet. Uh -huh. that, that's an evolving field with inputs from technology uh, developers like ourselves, uh, of course the, the uh, uh, government, uh, the, the regulatory bodies, and the, uh, the agencies like IEEE, SAE, UL, traditional, uh, ISO, uh, uh, tra traditional organizations uh, working on several standards. Hmm. Okay. One of the things that uh, really impresses me about this is the number of disciplines that are required to make something like this happen. I mean, it seems like electrical, mechanical, uh, probably legal is probably bigger than any of those. But w why don't you talk to that? Um, uh, of course, I mean, one thing that attracted both of us to, to robotics in the first place is that it is such an interesting cross-functional discipline that you can't get away with uh, being a one-trick pony. You can't just be, say, like a, a, a particular algorithm expert or just interested in computer vision or just interested in motion planning or just interested in designing the hardware. For any robot to be successful, everything has to fall in place. Everything has to be in concept. Everything has to be thought from day zero as a system. And that is such a refreshing uh, way of thinking about problems and problem solving. What is the problem? How do I quantify the problem? How can I design a system uh, to solve this problem? What are the attributes of the system? What are the components? What is the hardware? What is the software? What is this? What is that? So uh, with, uh, we've been very lucky to, to have uh, the opportunity to start working on robotic systems early in our careers as, as uh, graduate students. And that taught us that a very valuable lesson of no matter what you are interested in or what you really would like to innovate on, you have to think in terms of a system and you need to make sure that you have all the other components in place at the sufficient level. And then once you have, once you close that loop, then you can go on and make in the individual improvements in, in, in different components. But yeah, that's the, the, uh, the beauty of uh, robotics is that it's not just one unidimensional. It is a combination of many, many, many sub-disciplines. I would imagine one of the toughest things in your field is the human factor, right? You've got real truck drivers with real experience and ways of doing things, and now you're adding this. How does that play in? Yeah, yeah we, have, we have a very experienced team uh, specialized with, with, with PhDs on um, 
human factors uh, for uh, human autonomy collaboration. Uh, both taking an eye and as well as the, the uh, a significant part of our uh, founding team uh, from, from our CMU days, we've actually spent a very long time thinking about how uh, autonomous machines and people will coexist. Mm -hmm. uh, how uh, they will interact because uh, un unless we really isolate and let the robots operate in a vacuum be it an autonomous vehicle or your robotic vacuum cleaner or a, a piece of robot to help on the assembly line etc uh, they have to be around people and they have to do something with people sometimes it is in the form of just avoiding people or communicating intent to the people so that they can basically not step on each other's toes. Sometimes it's in the form of collaboration so that they need to share a mental model somehow. The computers and all the number crunching has to turn into a, a concise distilled information pieces so that humans can understand and reciprocate. Sometimes it is in the form of uh, machines or autonomous uh, machines guiding and guarding the people so that even if uh, people would like to do something of nominal the machines will be the, the babysitter and then will will come in and save you sometimes it's the other way around so there are certain things that are still extremely natural for for us humans and are notoriously difficult for machines so sometimes the role is flipped and our human guided convoy approach is is a very nice um, combination of all of these elements. We are relying on the uh, semantic understanding, if you will, reading the room capabilities of expert human drivers to prevent autonomy from getting confused and getting um, challenged by the, the uh, variety of situations in the real world. At the same time, we are getting our autonomy algorithms to assist the human driver becoming a better human driver with the, the superhuman reaction times and uh, never distracted, always looking at everywhere, nature of the, the machines and anything in between. It is a fascinating problem to think how yeah. machines and people will coexist. You know, one of the things I was thinking of, in addition to the truck drivers, you've got all the other drivers, like people with cars. And how will you, you know, they, so you're sort of treating these two trucks that are in, you know, a convoy with each other as one vehicle. How do you communicate that to the other vehicles so they don't, for instance, try to get between the trucks. Yeah, right. You know, that, yeah. that communication has to be so, again, so effective, so concise mm -hmm. that it's not disturbing or it's not distracting. Because that's mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do. You don't want to just like distract someone who is who needs to be paying attention to right. the road and saying, hey, like, I'm about to do something. Maybe you are interested in that. So that, that communication has to be so subtle, mm -hmm. yet so uh, emphasize so that it's not uh, it's not overlooked mm -hmm. by the people. But that's a, that, that, again a fascinating uh, problem. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I would imagine uh, doing this all within the framework of of what is a kind of nebulous still as far as regular regulatory environment too, right? That has to play into it. Uh, yes. Uh, we, we, we see it as, a, as an opportunity rather than a challenge, actually, because the, the regulatory environment is, again, like it's not complete Wild West. There is a regulatory environment, but it is conducive. It's constructive and it's supportive rather than being prohibitive, preemptively prohibitive. And um, it's going to be a, a several iterations. It's going to be a co-evolving field as we understand more about what it means to be safe, what it means to be reliable, what it means to be acceptable uh, by the rest of the, the, the society, the regulations will form around that and formalize that. How close are the, car, are the trucks to each other, you know, generally? Uh, we define the, the, the following uh, gap in, in terms of time instead of uh, distance. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the commercial version, uh, we anticipate these systems will operate at around half a second or maybe a little bit less than that gap uh, that will translate to something like 10 to 15 meters depending on your speed at, at highway speeds it's going to be uh, close to 15 meters at lower speeds it's going to be tighter 
but it's not just going to be the speed that will determine the, the ideal uh, following distance. It's going to be a bunch of other factors like the road topology, uh, are you going uphill, downhill, mm -hmm. the relative um, uh, differences between the two trucks, is one heavier than the other, is the leader heavier, is the follower heavier, what is their relative braking capabilities, etc. So a number of uh, factors will continuously be fed into a, a magical function that will spit out what is the ideal uh, gap distance for mm -hmm. that particular period of time. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, is uh, unlike some platooning ideas initially where you might have a whole train or whatever, right. yours uh, are from the same company. Uh, they're not it's not a dynamic platoon in the sense that they'll expand or grow. You're starting with two trucks, right? Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the that's the uh, uh, first bar to clear. If you cannot get that to work, you can never get to a more dynamic ad hoc uh I'm gonna meet you at the down the road, and we're gonna just like go convoy somewhere. Right. If that if we cannot make it work with this extremely regimented, prescriptive, well maintained, well defined, near identical, it will never be identical. But whatever we can do to get them as close to each other as possible, uh, and then over time, of course, as as the technology matures and as as um, we make more progress, collect more evidence, we can then see. If and when we can start relaxing some of those constraints. But here's the thing for the optimal deployment of autonomous vehicles in general, uh, they will almost have to be operated in a tightly uh, strict regimen. You will have to be very prescriptive, you will have to pre route, pre schedule, and uh, otherwise, uh, you cannot keep these assets operating around the clock. We are hoping that, we are aiming for operating the, the, the trucks around up, up to 22 hours a day and each truck to make about a thousand miles a day. Wow. If we can hit wow. that, then the ex these, because these guys are going to be expensive assets, so you need to uh, provide maximum uptime so that the return on investment is maximum for the customers, so everybody wants to deploy this um, more wildly. So how much customization of these trucks is required to be able to do this? You know, what, how, how big an investment it is or how, you know, how, how extensive are, are the changes? Yeah, it's, uh, it's still fairly expensive, but uh, the value proposition in exchange of that is so enormous that it, mm -hmm. you can justify uh, tens of thousands of dollars uh, of uh, hardware on the um, on the trucks plus significant amount of subscription and service fees. Mm -hmm. um, we are effectively, uh, we are uh, adding the eyes, the brains and the arms and legs of a, of a robot. When mm -hmm. you start with a base truck, a compatible truck, uh, we are adding sensors, different kinds of sensors, lidars, radars, cameras. Uh, there is a different kind of computing units for the high level autonomy algorithms as well as tighter, low-level control systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, there are uh, electronically controllable steering, brake, and powertrain um, mm -hmm. integration elements. So that's the arms and legs part of it. So mm -hmm. Just by sending a few um, uh, messages or a few bits here and there, you can turn the steering wheel, you can command the brakes, and you can command the throttle. Mm -hmm. uh, that, is, that is basically the... the ed add-on hardware layer that transforms an otherwise traditional truck to a self-driving truck. And to be clear, there are, I, I do want to ask a question about the technology, but in your scenario, you still have drivers in each truck, correct? It, the first phase that we are launching is a two-truck, two-driver convoy uh, scenario, yes? So that, uh, and it is, uh, its autonomy is limited to interstate segments. So when the, the trucks are just like leaving the depot, there's usually a handful of miles. It's not a long run, mm -hmm. but it's a handful of miles uh, on the surface streets until they hit the interstate. Uh, so that part is going to be handled manually, just like it is done today, so that we don't have to delay the launch of the technology until we solve complicated autonomous urban driving problem. And when they are on the interstate segment uh, and the technology is turned on, uh, the uh, first truck 
the, the driver remains in control, remains on the clock. But the second truck turns into the self-driving autonomous uh, follower mode so that the driver in the second truck can then sign off, uh, get off the clock, go into the back and rest there, take their mandated federal rest. And every now and then at predetermined intervals, the trucks can swap places so that each driver spends enough time driving the convoy and enough time uh, taking a rest. And when they are at the end of that highway stretch, they can turn off the system, go manual, mm -hmm. drive off the highway and do, again, the couple of miles in the, in the final stretch of the uh, journey. That's how it's going to work initially. You know, one of the things uh, it's, it seems to me is, uh, and again, it's, a, it's, it's your vehicle, but it's also the interaction with other traffic is, you know, you're supposed to stay a certain distance away from the vehicle in front of you, right? Um, you know, depending upon how fast you're going, how fast you could brake. When you've got a two vehicle system like this, it's going to expand that distance somewhat. Um, you know, how roughly how much more does that add to the distance you, you would ideally be able to keep between your vehicles and other vehicles? Right. Uh, since these uh, trucks are not physically tethered, yeah, yeah. but they are, they are electronically tethered, mm -hmm. they almost act in unison. Hmm. So uh, uh, you actually do not need extra stopping distance or you don't, you don't need really? extra wow. room uh, for that. That's the beauty yeah. for physically linked, really like long combination vehicles. That's what they call them. Then you are dealing with a different level of inertia, different mm -hmm. level of acceleration, deceleration profiles, mm -hmm. etc. In our case, they are pretty much like your run-of-the-mill single trucks. Mm -hmm. They just happen to be coordinating among themselves so that they can accelerate at the same time, mm -hmm. brake at the same time, and one follows the, the other through the curvatures, through the construction zones, through wherever they need to go uh, over the interstate. Interesting. Okay. And I think we talked about that before, but there you have some level of redundancy. And my, my concern was on that virtual a path that virtual leash between these trucks the the rf frequencies right. that they're you know there aren't going to be radio um, i mean interference issues or or jamming issues or things right. like that or yeah. hacking yeah, you know. yeah are, exactly yeah different parts of the the system has different levels of uh, safety criticality and hence different levels of reliability numbers that we need to uh, we need to prove uh, around mean time between failures and uh we need to make sure that uh, since the follower uh, vehicle, uh, when it's in the autonomy mode, there is no driver to take over. The driver is sleeping in the back. You cannot rely on that. So that system has to be proven to be fail operational. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes for certain parts of the, the system, uh, the, the easier or more practical way of reaching those reliability numbers is through redundancy. So you can take two otherwise less reliable systems, put them in a redundant configuration and the, the collection of that system all of a sudden has the required reliability number. Sometimes for different parts of the system, you can achieve the same reliability numbers uh, without redundancy because uh, ultimately there is some form of proof that underlying component is super reliable. There is mm. no way that it's going to fail. So. Uh, for uh, the electromechanical parts, like steering, brake, uh, uh, and, um, and as well as some electronic parts, like vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, um, redundancy, in, in some form, redundancy is prudent and is a, a more practical way of achieving the required reliability levels. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we do have uh, redundancy. And for some other parts, again, we look at the numbers and we, the numbers tell us if whether we need to invest in dual, triple, or whatever redundancy there, or uh, the baseline reliability numbers are just enough for uh, that purpose. So is the communication between the vehicles encrypted? Uh, yeah, of course it will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you got some security security elements there too. Right, right. Okay. right. Yeah, it sounds like you're using V to V uh, type, the 5.9 gigahertz type uh, stuff. We are experimenting with a, with a bunch of different uh, technologies, but yes, uh, in general, uh, so our first generation prototypes were using DSRC. Mm -hmm. Our uh, third generation, we are uh, working on CV2X, but in okay. general, we still have not committed to a, a particular um, technology. There's still a, a down-select process uh, going on. Uh, do you see any... Um 
you know, the FCC clawed back 30 megahertz, I think it was, um, or 45 megahertz, I should say, from the 75 megahertz that they had allocated for vehicle-to-vehicle communications. Is that a downside for you guys, or do you have enough to... No, not at all, because uh, fundamentally, all we are interested in is a reliable way of uh, sending messages between two relatively stationary uh, uh, transceivers. Hmm. So... Uh, that actually gives us a, a larger field to play in and uh, maintain a, a little bit more agnostic eye. Uh, so we have... Yeah, it's low bandwidth, system. I assume, between the two, right? Right, right. And that's ironic. There there goes a band behind you. So I don't <laughs> there, think it's one of yours, though. <laughs> <laughs> UPS. Yeah. yeah. It's not a virus. So... Coming at this from an academic perspective, is this you, both your first startup, or have you done this before? Uh, we've been, we've had some startup adventures, but uh, none of those uh, actually turned into an actual company and uh, turned into like a real endeavor, like like Locomation did. Hmm. So this, this is not our first uh, exposure to the startup uh, scene or the entrepreneurship. Uh, but this is the the first time we are actually really like locomation is that like a real company now. <laughs> and who are your investors? Can you say? Uh, yeah, of course there are a number of. Uh, we are mostly backed by uh, institutional venture capitalists uh, mm -hmm. all over the place. We have investors from Silicon Valley, uh, mm -hmm. like Plug and Play Ventures, Aviate Ventures, Fusion Fund. Uh, we have. Um, Investors from uh, more Midwest, uh, Colorado-based, like Blackhorn Ventures. We have mm -hmm. investors from Pittsburgh, our hometown, like Draper Triangle Ventures. Mm -hmm. We have investors from Japan, investors from Europe, investors from Mexico, investors from Turkey. So it's a, a really a diverse uh, pool. Uh, but th that is, again, uh, the, the defining characteristic is uh, institutional venture capital. And from a customer perspective, you have some fairly large trucking companies that have committed to you, correct? Of course, yeah. Uh, we have we have two publicly announced um, customers. One is Wilson Logistics, uh, a really, really uh, well-known uh, leading um, fleet, the uh, box trailer, dry, dry van um, uh, industry or segment. And our second uh customer is PGT Trucking, again from our hometown of Pittsburgh, and they are, a, again, a very well-known, uh, with very high reputation, flatbed uh, operators. Uh, both co uh, companies are considered mid-size. They have, uh, I believe, 14, 1500 each tractors right now, but one of the, the uh, important uh, characteristics of those companies are that they are very fast growers. They are very aggressively growing and uh, they are very fast adopters of, of technology so that they can compound their growth. And it seems like there's several things where you, you know, even in its first iteration, it helps their business model. Um, and you mentioned a couple of those, but, uh, you know, where, where does, you know, where, where, what are those kind of stepping yeah. stones to, you know, helping them? In short, uh, our uh, autonomous relay convoy, the first product that we are launching, enables the delivery of twice as much cargo to twice as far and twice as fast, while reducing the per mile operating costs by 30%. But, and after, even after paying the locomation, uh, the uh, cost of the hardware and the subscription fees, etc., uh, our customers will still be looking at around uh, quadrupling their profit margins. And with that ability, uh, that actually will give them the, uh, the chance, uh, an opportunity of going after extended revenue uh, venues even more aggressively and grow their bottom line even faster. So it's a one-two punch. They will be able to grow their revenue faster and they'll be able to make more profits uh, for, for each mile they drive. So does it start to kind of compete with maybe uh, thin route train lines or something like that? This isn't my area, but does it start to open the market that way? In the medium term, yes. In the near term, that is still uh, 
more expensive than uh, traditional intermodal or, 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 or those, but um, it is all of a sudden it becomes extremely competitively advantaged to, uh, with respect to any kind of other trucking operations. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the future, when the technology is mature enough to be deployed in solo autonomy with no driver at all, then the uh, the cost basis uh, starts approximating, uh, starts becoming very competitive with rail in some ways, mm. and starts becoming very competitive with air from a speed mm. point in some ways. Mm. So when do you think we're going to actually see this uh, being used commercially? Ah, I mean, for our uh, products, it's going to be late next year. Wow. Okay. But of course, it is... Uh, it's going to take a really long time for this to become really ubiquitous. Uh, yeah, yeah. There are close to 4 million Class 8 trucks in just in the United States, 3.7 million to be exact. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we do our jobs right and if we can grow aggressively, we will have several tens of thousands of trucks on the roads in the next five years. Mm -hmm. So if everything is right, we'll have, I don't know, like 1% penetration. <laughs> and because it's going to take a really, really long time to, to change everything that is required for uh, for really mainstream application of this. Does it become kind of like a franchise type thing where you provide the technology to certified installers or whatever? That's yeah, that's that's the idea. We we are uh, uh, we are always prioritizing staying lean staying uh, focused on what we know how to do best and form partnerships with our valuable uh, partners who knows what they do best. Mm -hmm. So for installation, service, uh, maintenance, we have a strategic partnership with the largest uh, truck dealership in the United States, Rush Enterprises. They will handle the installation, mm -hmm. they will provide warranty, they will provide service and repair because that's what they know how to do best. And we are working with uh, tier one suppliers and OEMs on the actual vehicle integrations because that's what they know best and we know how to build robots best. So we are uh, sticking to our core competence and staying lean. Hmm. Wow, it's really fascinating uh, what you guys are doing there. And uh, I like the, the taking the simple concept and just trying to perfect that, you know, um, especially because a lot of roads, you know, in the US, the uh, really long stretches are two lane roads. We talked about that earlier. So going more than two trucks would be big logistical issues, I think. Yeah, it becomes it becomes a, a, everybody instinctively thinks that this is a bigger technical challenge, but actually the technical challenge there is uh, not that big. Hmm. Uh, the bigger challenges, as you said, are uh, logistics challenges of lining up uh, hmm. three, four, five, six trucks at a time, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, social challenges around like now you are looking at a road train that is slower than the rest of the traffic that's yeah. like very long it's impossible to navigate around and people are uh, going crazy uh, so dealing with that mm -hmm. and lastly uh some of the uh states in 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 united states has very old infrastructure elements like some old bridges etc mm -hmm. some of them are uh, might not be rated for the weight and the vibration characteristics uh, of longer uh, convoys. There uh, are some, some research groups uh, actually uh, working on characterizing all these infrastructure elements and determining the optimal convoy uh, allowance, if you will, there. So on this bridge, you can operate with three trucks going at 40 miles an hour, but on this bridge, you can only operate with two going at 50 miles an hour. Things wow. like that. Wow. Wow. That's fa Are there any limitations with the two right now, or is that uh... no? Two is two is perfect because it's literally the minimum viable product. I mean, you need at least two to yeah. do the going, and and it's not too heavy for bridges, then. Huh? Exactly, exactly. Huh. Huh. And this gets to that back to that whole multidiscipline thing, right? If <laughs> having people yeah. around think of those kinds of obscure things, I wouldn't have thought of. <laughs> And, and that's something I think, you know, uh, we need to do a better job in general about uh, helping people to be to be multidisciplinary, to be part of teams that uh, span, you know, various technical disciplines, you know, for example. And um, you know, do you have difficulties finding people like that? Do you need help uh, training, pay, help yeah, institutions train yeah. people to do that? <laughs> of 
of course, we are we are always looking to uh, looking to find and and hire very very talented teammates. Uh, mm -hmm. We are very proud of the team that we were able to uh, build so far. We were able to convince fabulous people to come and join us and join forces. Uh, but of course, we, we are still in in our growth phase, so we will be looking to to hire many more people. Um, and uh, you 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 said something really really important, Tom. It's, uh, we need to do a better job in uh, training in yep. interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary people. That's not traditionally how the the academia is um, uh, set up and uh, how the research is encouraged. Because in academia, you are uh, encouraged or maybe even um, forced to become more and more specialized as you mm -hmm. move, instead of becoming a more and more of a polymath or a, like a renaissance. A renaissance right. people are usually good. They are having, they know a lot of things and they have a lot of fun, but they are not considered super deep academics because they haven't gone that deep and that narrow in, in one. So there is a little bit of um, a metric and success metric uh, issue that yeah. maybe we worked on. And maybe some other clever things of like, how do we expose uh, people to the as many disciplines as possible within mm -hmm. the formal framework so mm -hmm. that they can pick and choose. Do they want to, to be one? Do they want to be five? Do they want to be anything in between? Like, right, right. How do you mix and match there? Yeah. So Ken, I probably got to get off here pretty soon to get ready for this next next uh, meeting. But uh, this has been really, really interesting, and I'm really glad to get a chance to talk to you guys too. Thank you. Uh, it's been great meeting you, and we'll be uh, we'll be uh, supporting you and and applauding on the sides <laughs> forward. If you're IEEE members, be sure to vote. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I mean, I, uh, we've been both Tekin and I have been members for about 20 years now. Excellent, excellent, good. And, and so. Uh, uh, yeah, Tom, I'll catch up with you in another uh, in a few minutes. I just yep. want to thank you guys very much for being part of this. Um, I also want to reiterate what Tom said. Tomorrow we're having the live event, the IEEE uh, history event at the Computer History Museum. It'll be streamed, and I'll tweet that out. And also um, the Smart Driving Car Summit, Alan Kornhauser's event, is November 2nd through the 5th. I think it's going to be live in Princeton. So I wore the, the shirt in honor of in honor of him. It's a great, fun event. Yeah, say hi to Ellen. I, I'm, I, I'm a fan. Right. I will. I will. Hey, guys. Thank you, guys, very much. Thank you so much. Have a Take care. Day. I really enjoy Bye. it. See you later. Bye. There we go. Yep. Take care, Taken.